listening to Table for Five with Felicia and Annette, only on L.A. Talk Radio. You've seen the view. You've heard all the real talk. Now have a seat at our table, a table for five. Good Monday morning. Good morning. We are live. Live. We are live. <laughs> yes. <laughs> live it's a and Monday well. Monday morning. It's, it's like it's very uh, much a Monday morning. Like a real, like straight out of the gate Monday. A morning. real, a real Monday morning. Mm-hmm. We are kind of shuffling here, guys. Today is Monday. Good Monday morning, uh, September. I don't know what today is. The twenty fourth. The twenty fourth. I didn't. I, yeah, I don't. I don't have the whole entire script in front okay. of me. Okay, I left it. <laughs> <laughs> I left that somewhere else. It's Monday, and <laughs> you are watching Table for Five. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to our table, where you, the listening and viewing audience, will always have a seat right here at our table, Table for Five, uh, with Felicia and Annette. I'm yes, Felicia. And I'm Annette. Yes. And we're going to do our quick housekeeping uh, that we always like to let everybody know, our viewers and our listening yes. uh, audience. Obviously, if you're <coughs> watching us, you know where to find us. But just a reminder to catch us on Instagram, on all our social media platforms, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and our website, which is our, I like to call our one-stop shop, where you can find out all the information on previous shows and upcoming shows, and you can also advertise with us. Um, There's a little link there. You could click on it and get all the information on how you can join us and be on our team for one show, two shows, a month of shows. Um, You get to pick your tier of choice, and someone very professional will get back to you on that. Yes. Yes, very professional. And today we have a quite a powerful show. Yes. We're going to get into it because we want to get as much information out to you. Today we have a power show and we are introducing our monthly segment, yes. our official monthly segment yes. with yes. Dr. Let's Kelly, the doctor's in. <laughs> And uh, I don't know what I was typing on there, but you want me to read her bio quickly? No, actually, you know, I do have it. I have all of it. Oh, oh hallelujah. <laughs> I lied. Yes, yes. Amen to that. Uh, so today's show is uh, maternal mortality rate among women of color. We're going to be talking to our in-studio lovely guest, Dr. Amanda Kelly. Yes. And on the phone, we have Miss Julie Chavez Rodriguez. We're going to bring her in here on the line. Julie, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Good morning. Good Good morning. morning. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, So, yes, I will go ahead and do introductory bios for, let me see, well, if I can get these pages turned. Right here here. in a really quick format. (laughs) I know you did it so professionally. (laughs) I had like a million other things going on this weekend, but you're good. So did I. (laughs) I know you did. You had school. (laughs) Anyways, uh, yes. So car accident. We'll talk about that. Oh, wow. Oh, Jesus. See, this is what happens when we don't do hot topics. (laughs) Then I do not know what's going on. Okay. Anyways, to my left here is Dr. Amanda Kelly. It's a board-certified emergency medical physician. She has been educated and trained in New Jersey and Philadelphia. Dr. Kelly is a proud alumni of Rutgers University in New Jersey. Upon completing her medical education at New Jersey Medical School in Newark, New Jersey, she went on to complete her emergency emergency medicine residency training at Albert Einstein Medical Center in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Dr. Car- Dr. Kelly currently practices at Northridge Hospital Medical Center, caring for the community of the San Fernando Valley. Northridge Hospital is a level two trauma center, mm. which opens its ER doors to both adult and pediatric patients. Though Dr. Kelly's primary job is to practice clinical medicine, she is very passionate about empowering and educating patients and people in the community to foster better patient-doctor relationships. She firmly believes the best care is achieved when both patients and doctors trust and understand each other. I love that. I know. It almost brings me to tears. (laughs) (laughs) It's super important. It is. It's very important. Do you want to do Miss Chavez? Yes, absolutely. And I'm sorry, Miss Chavez phone, Rodriguez. Yes, on the phone, we have the privilege of having <laughs> a Miss Julie Chavez Rodriguez. She is the state director for the United States Senator Kamala D. Harris. In this role, Julie oversees all office operations across five district offices and serves as the senator's principal representative among constituents and elected leaders throughout California. Previously, Julie was a special assistant to the president to President Obama and Senior Deputy Director of Public Engagement at the White House. That must have been a great job. In that capacity, Julie managed a team of associate directors working with leaders in the LGBT, AAPI, Latino, veterans, youth, 
education, labor, and progressive communities, and supported efforts to reform the nation's immigration system, improve services for veterans, and increase access to affordable quality health care, among other issues. Julie also worked in coordination with the White House's National Security Council on efforts to normalize the United States' relationship with Cuba, in addition to responding to the migration of Central American children and their families. Prior to joining the White House, Julie served as the Director of Youth Employment in the Department of the Interior and the Deputy Press Secretary to former Secretary of the Interior, Ken Salazar. Julie was born and raised in California, Central Valley, attended UC Berkeley, and worked for the Cesar, Cesar E. Chavez Foundation in Los Angeles for nine years prior to joining the Obama administration. Oh, wow. wow, that welcome. was a mouthful. Yes. <laughs> I, that, welcome, that welcome to our show. Uh, Both ladies. Of yes. That's fantastic. What, so, so what? yeah, we have, so I just want to say really quickly to our viewers and our listeners that this topic was brought to us initially by Dr. Kelly when we met in the summer and she was we were kind of just you know brainstorming what topics would be really uh important and she, oh she sorry. brought <laughs> uh, she brought um this topic to our attention and little did we know there was an actual bill yeah. being presented so thank you for bringing that to You're our welcome. attention and yes. um thank you i'm gonna go shut that off because yes, it's gonna do. drive us crazy <laughs> or Hold i can on. do it no i got it okay or you could just throw it over here to me. <laughs> just keep going, keep going. Um, yes. So, so today we have uh, Julie here who is going to be talking about, we had submitted qu some questions mm -hmm. early on. Um, so, Julie, would you like to start with the questions or would you like to give us just an overview of the bill? The bill um, we have the bill here. I don't know if we're going to put it up. Can we put it up on Facebook, a link? To, to it, do bill. we have yeah. that? So first of all, uh, Ms. Chop, Ms. Rodriguez, thank you for joining us. I wanted to ask, um, I was able to read, we were all able to read the bill. Yes, I When had did this come into play? Um, so I would say this has been sort of an ongoing um, issue that the senator has been aware of um, for some time. I think, you know, more recently, and Dr. Kelly, you probably know better than anyone, um, there has been more recent, I would say, public reports and media reports really underscoring, um, in particular, the significant disparities in maternal health for women of color and for black women in particular. Um, you know, just to um, share with your uh, listeners and viewers, black women are three to four times more likely to experience a pregnancy-related death than white women. Um, and it, you know, it, it uh, doesn't matter in terms of socioeconomic status, um, at levels of education, it really is across the board. And I think that there's been two higher profile, um, you know, black women who have experienced um, some of these sort of uh, severe conditions in, um, you know, throughout their pregnancy and, and um, during birth um, that has, has really brought the issue to the forefront. Um, people have probably seen some of the I think really courageous, um, you know, and important interviews that people like Beyonce and Serena Williams have given really um, mm -hmm. highlighting their experience and um, I think again really uh, exposing the fact that, um, you know, throughout our, um, you know, medical system and medical care system that there are longstanding racial biases and, um, you know, uh, racial discrimination that exists, um, not just for black women but for um, folks of color. and so. Um, this was an attempt to start to, to really look at what some of these root causes are um, that's resulting in, um, you know, some of these horrific statistics. Uh, United States is one of 13 countries that has seen actually um, an increase in their maternal mortality rates mm -hmm. over the past 25 years. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, this day and age when we have the advancements of modern medicine and technology that are you know, catalyzing and catapulting um, our society in so many different ways, um, really needing to look at how does that, you know, how does that relate to our, our healthcare system and our, our medical system and how do we make sure that folks are getting more culturally competent um, care that they deserve and that they need. Yeah, and just to quickly piggyback to give you like some numbers, the maternal mortality rate um, are among the highest in the developed world and increased by 26 percent here in in, a, in the United States between the years of 2000 and 2014. So that's a 26 per 26.6 percent increase. That's like astonish astonishing. I think it's important to realize that you know 
in the 20th century, so like 1990s, things like that, uh, 80s, that the maternal mortality rate actually was decreasing. Mm -hmm. And then you got to like 99, 2000, all of a sudden it started decreasing. And also there's an issue with infant mortality rates too. Infant mortality rates and uh, maternal mortality rates kind of go hand in hand to kind of give you a little clue into the health of a nation because if you don't have women and you don't have children, the nation doesn't continue to grow. Right. So America is a country that's a, you know, a developed country. It's one of the leading countries in the world. And if you compare it to Britain or you know, Denmark, other developed countries, like our numbers are astronomically higher. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. When I was doing some research, research the UK, they you know, spend a lot of time making sure that their mortality rates are decreasing. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, just as Ms. Rodriguez talked about, there's a lot of celebrities now that are sharing their experience. So I guess more, uh, I hate to say lay people, but people who are not in medicine are starting to realize that this is really an issue. And so this bill I think is important in trying mm -hmm. to make the first steps so we can start to really address this issue and drive our numbers down. Because if mothers aren't healthy, then babies aren't healthy, and then we have a problem in America. Yeah, and some people, m okay. Go ahead, no, go ahead. I was gonna say, some people might say, why do we need to have a bill? Why do we have to put it in a bill? Why does it have to be submitted? Why does it have to be government regulated? Why does the government have to be involved? Why can't it be just uh, done at the state level? Or why do, why do we have to put it on the books? Like, why is that so important? Is that for me or for Ms. Rodriguez? I would say for anybody. For Whoever, both. Yeah, whoever, anybody that has an opinion about that. Uh, Ms. Rodriguez, do you wanna go first or you want me to answer that? <laughs> Maybe I'll, um, I'll jump in, uh, and I can also provide an overview of the bill if that would be helpful. Perfect. Um, but I think first and foremost, you know, again, what we've seen is this trend over the last 25 years where we're, um, we're not improving, and in fact, we're, it, matters are getting worse. And mm -hmm. so um, I think that's really where this federal legislation comes in to be able to provide some important, um, you know, grant programs and to really, you know, uh, sort of engage the medical community to more effectively study the um, concerns that are being raised and to evaluate some of the strategies that we're um, putting forward that we think could be effective. Mm -hmm. um, and so just to give you really quickly, the name of the bill is the Maternal Care Access and Reducing Emergencies Act or the Maternal um, in all caps CARE Act. Mm -hmm. um, there are three main components to the bill. Uh, the first would be a grant program for implicit bias training grants mm -hmm. um, that would be available um, on a competitive basis to um, medical schools, nursing schools, other um, you know health professionals um, to really be able to engage their um, you know healthcare providers and healthcare professionals in um, implicit bias training um, and to begin to again get at the heart of what we know are oftentimes racial disparities within our healthcare system and uh, delivery system. Absolutely. The second component would be a pregnancy medical home demonstration project that would assist up to 10 states with implementing and uh, sustaining a pregnancy medical home program to really incentivize maternal healthcare providers uh, to deliver more integrated care services for pregnant women and new mothers. Um, again, this is an opportunity to be able to um, provide some, you know, funding for demonstration projects to be able to assess what will work or what are the most effective interventions um, that will improve the, you know, rates that we're seeing, especially for communities that more, are more adversely impacted like black women and women of color. Um, and then the third component of the bill would be directing the National Academy of Medicine to study and make recommendations for incorporating uh, bias recognition into uh, clinical skills testing for U.S. medical schools. So really looking at um, what I would say, you know, short, mid, and longer term strategies um, to, to get at, again, the root of, of what we've seen in terms of racial biases within, um, within our healthcare system. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I really like the bill. Um, it's interesting because going through the process of med school, uh, when I was going through it, mm, I don't know, maybe eight to ten years ago, um, <coughs> we had uh, <coughs> training on uh, cultural competency. And at that time, cultural competency, competency didn't include implicit bias as it pertains to uh, you know, mater mort uh, maternal mortality rates. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, one of the questions that I had, for me, you know, going through med school, you kind of get that training, maybe you remember it, sometimes it sticks, you try to apply it once you start practicing medicine. Um, I don't know 
how you know you could take the bill a step further and maybe try to make this training applicable to physicians that are already practicing. Mm -hmm. uh, most of us that practice have to have continuing uh, medical education credits to maintain our board certification and our licenses. Um, I think it would be very helpful to include this training because as a physician, you know, I don't know, I tend to think that I'm a little bit more introspective, so I recognize sometimes that I do have mm -hmm. implicit biases. And even as an African-American woman practicing medicine, sometimes those biases against African-American people affect me as well. So, you know, we need this training for everybody, whether you're a black physician, Hispanic physician, Caucasian student, uh, student whatever. But um, I, I would definitely like to see the bill applied to people who are already practicing. And I think that would maybe have a more immediate effect because mm -hmm. we are people already caring yeah. uh, for that pregnant women. That's a good idea. Yeah, That's a great idea. Um, and I, I could, you know, I couldn't agree with you um, more in terms of the <laughs> continuing education um, and the fact that all of us, no matter who we are, no matter where we've grown up, um, no matter what our own experiences have been, um, that we are all, you know, subject to this kind of, you know, uh, a too implicit bias and that um, only through real awareness and training and, you know, ensuring that we are um, addressing this at a more systemic level um, are we going to um, to begin to um, you know ensure that these biases that we all carry don't then um, factor into the day-to-day -day work that we are expected to um, deliver regardless of who our you know constituent patient um, sort of end user is um, and uh, you know this is implicit bias is something that um, you know the senator had really tackled um, when she was AG or worked on, I should say, when she was AG and developed um, what has now become a certified training program for law enforcement um, around, um, you know, implicit bias. And um, I think that, again, it's, it's important that we um, take these, you know, critical steps and look at um, how, do we, how do we ensure we're infusing this into um, kind of the training and the systems that are are um, you know helping to guide these professionals as they're coming into um, into the field? Right, yeah, absolutely. I, I have a question. Um, I'm, so I know uh, Dr. Kelly just explained to me the non-white. What is it? What did you say? Not non-Hispanic. Uh, non-Hispanic. You're talking about when you're mm -hmm. comparing. Oh, okay. So uh, I think what Annette is referring to. Um, so I think your bill uh, addresses the. Um, I guess the increased uh, morbidity and mortality rates for African American women, and Annette was wondering, uh, I guess, is there any data about Hispanic yeah. women? Because in a lot of the research that you come across, mm -hmm. it compares <coughs> African Americans to non-Hispanic white women. So where mm -hmm. does that place other minorities? Um, I guess in this fight yeah. for uh, you know the increased morbidity and mortality. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's, um, as I mentioned, it's an issue that women of color across the board, I think, have faced. Um, I don't have the exact statistics for um, Hispanic women in front of me. I know that they are um, higher than those of white women, but mm -hmm. lower than those of, of uh, right. African-American women. Um, but I think with, you know, given the approach that we've taken with the um, Maternal Care Act um, and really, you know, addressing sort of the foundation of implicit bias or looking at that as the main um, point of, that we want to tackle, um, we see the implicit bias training as being able to really support and impact um, all communities as they're interfacing with mm -hmm. the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. We think um, you know, that this sort of approach will, it will create and begin to um, develop more culturally competent um, mm -hmm. physicians, um, you know, nurse practitioners, individuals that are interfacing um, at various stages with patients throughout the process. Um, so we don't, uh, we don't see this as just solely um, benefiting um, black women. We see this as looking at how do we improve the system and make it more culturally competent mm -hmm. across the board. Um, one statistic that shows that it currently isn't um, is the, you know, the black women mortality rate um, and that of, of others. But um, again, we see this as really an opportunity to kind of lift all boats. Um, right. And then with mm -hmm. the demonstration project, you know, um, we, there is an evaluation component to that. Um, mm -hmm. So once we have more evaluation data, um, really looking at, again, what are some of these critical interventions and how can we expand it beyond just the 10 initial states to more states and more communities. Yeah. Okay, that was kind of one of my questions about yeah. why it was limited to 10 states, but obviously you guys plan to 
expand um <clears throat> just about the bill just so everyone's kind of on the same page because it's easy to just say implicit bias but i don't know that everyone kind of knows what that means um so implicit bias is kind of biases or maybe stereotypes or you know potential thoughts that you have about a person just based on their race or what they look like that's really not very conscious to you you may not even be mm -hmm. aware of it so for instance there's been a lot of surveys and studies done I don't know for med students or people in medicine like do you believe that African Americans have different nerve endings that maybe uh, mm -hmm. have them perceive pain differently or they have a higher tolerance of, for pain and some of the students will answer yes to that question, mm -hmm. meaning they think that black patients perceive pain differently. And that's not true at all, <laughs> right. um, but it's something that they think in right. their head, so that may lead to a bias in that they yeah. don't give as much pain medication or they feel like African-American um, patients can deal with more pain. And I actually see that in practice. And can you imagine being in labor and wow. someone thinking that you can <sighs> handle pain better than an African-American, I mean, better than a, 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 a white person or right. someone who's not African-American or Hispanic? Those are the type of things where physicians or anyone handling patients need training because that's kind of unfair to not get the yeah. same treatment as someone else just because of what someone thinks and Their it's not necessarily idea, a racist yeah. thing it's just a bias that you have their in your perception. head that someone hasn't told you is not true. Yeah, their perception. And it's and it's interesting, and I'm glad that in the bill that um, this research is cited. So in part of the bill, it says in a, tw two a 2016 study by University of Virginia researchers found that white medical students and residents often believe biological myths about <laughs> racial differences in patients, including that black patients have less sensitive nerve endings right. and thicker skin than their white counterparts. So this is a study that was done in 2016. Right. Let's mm -hmm. pause and think about that for a minute. This isn't something that a study that was done in 1972 or 1965 or even 1991 for that matter. Right. This was two years ago that people still, uh, students are still believing this. And so right. when I read this, I was like, this is astounding to me that in this day and age, this time, you know, these medical students who are younger than me are st still would have these bias, these mm -hmm. these perceptions, mm -hmm. um, and so it to me just if anyone questions the bill, just that based on that research alone to me is very alarming. Mm -hmm. So where does the bill stand right now? Like what's next for the bill? Is it what what is it being status? voted on? When yeah, going to be passed. <laughs> like where? Yeah, where are, where are we, we at? Bill? So um, the senator has uh, obviously introduced the bill in um, the Senate. It's had uh, some tremendous support just uh, to share with you all in terms of who's endorsed the bill, the American mm -hmm. Academy of Nursing, mm -hmm. American Colleges of uh, Nurse Midwives, American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, um, amongst many others. Um, we have uh, also you know, uh, over a dozen co-sponsors in the Senate, so we're going to continue to build support there. Um, a companion bill has also been introduced in the House of Representatives, so we're excited that um, we do have a bill in uh, both of the chambers. Um, you know, unfortunately, we are mm -hmm. in a near sort of election season, and mm -hmm. so um, oftentimes a lot of legislation doesn't get passed during this time, um, mm -hmm. but we are continuing to really build support, make sure that we're getting out and talking to folks like you all um, so that people are also helping to kind of put um, additional pressure and demonstrate their support with their members of Congress, whether in the House or in the Senate. Mm -hmm. um, and so we are um, going to just, again, continue to build coalitions around this and hope that um, once we uh, get past the elections and have um, what's sort of called the lame duck uh, session before the end of mm -hmm. the year and before the new Congress is sworn in, um, to see if we can move this forward. Um, if we don't get it done by the end of this year, we will be introducing it immediately at the beginning of next year. And Dr. Kelly, I really love your idea about um, the ongoing um, and continuing education. Mm -hmm. um, and so if it doesn't get passed this year, I think that that's a component we'll really want to add for, the, um, for reintroduction mm -hmm. or to modify it as it's continuing to move forward. So um, just, you know, again, appreciate the opportunity to share with you all about the components of the bill. Um, but also great to have some real direct uh, feedback from, um, you know, practitioners like you, Dr. Kelly, in the field who, who can really speak to what will be most effective um, now and, and moving forward. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, and one um, before you go, one, where is the money coming from? <laughs> Five million dollars a year? So where would that be funded from? The government funding or private funding? Uh, 
Yes, it would be government funding. It would be funding through um, Health and Human Services um, and through, you know, one of their um, specific line items. Um, so it would be government funded. Um, and when you asked earlier about the limitation to 10 states, that's oftentimes what is the limiting factor um, when it comes to, um, you know, initiating these kinds of demonstration projects is how much funding do we think realistically could be made available um, that would be, you know, that would actually make a difference um, and have an impact. And then looking at, you know, once we have those kind of best practices and lessons learned, how we can scale up. Um, and, you know, it ensures that, again, we're being good stewards of taxpayer dollars, but also investing in, in the really critical um, kind of work that, that's um, most important to our community today. Absolutely. Awesome. I, absolutely. I, I wholeheartedly agree. Um, just really quickly before you go, what can we do as just people who are just regular people, voting citizens? Um, what can we do to aid in getting this bill pushed forward? Like something specific that I or our listeners can can do or that you would suggest? So um, I think a couple of things. One, um, for any of your listeners who want to reach out to their um, you know, met local members and to just let them know that the Maternal Care Act is something that they think is important and something that should be supported. Um, we always welcome um, those opportunities because each call, and I can tell you firsthand being in a Senate office here in the state of California, um, each call that every office gets gets tabulated and those numbers get reported up. And mm -hmm. so it's really important that constituents make their voices heard in those ways um, and looking at direct outreach to, um, to you know, their representatives. I would say the second thing that um, folks can do is exactly what you all are doing today. Any kind of public awareness or education that we can um, you know, continue to build around this issue, um, whether it's writing an op-ed, a letter to the editor, um, or you know, tuning into your show and um, doing a Facebook, you know, Facebook post about it or tweeting about it, mm -hmm. um, that kind of public education is so important and so necessary. And then the third point that I would say is um, I hope that all of your listeners are registered to vote. I mm -hmm. hope they yes. understand how important um, you know, every Absolutely. single election is um, because it's a real way for us to you know, really show what matters, show where um, you know, our values are, and, um, and continue to try to you know, get folks um, that are representing them that actually reflect their values. So I think those are sort of the three immediate things that, um, that I think you and your listeners could help with. And it doesn't have to be in the state of California, correct? Like no matter what state you're listening from, you can still encourage your representatives mm -hmm. from that state to support this bill, correct? Correct. And I would say um, for folks outside of California, it's even more important because we have uh, some strong support, I think, already here in the state. Yeah. yeah. California yeah. is actually one of the more progressive states. In yes. Yay. yes. <laughs> so all you listeners out there, viewers and listeners in different states, get get on it. I mean, it's not going to affect just people here in California. Like we, we're not just concerned about it here. It's everywhere. It could be in your state. It could be your family member, your sister, uh, you know, your daughter. I, your I will say this as a physician who knows all the risk i am terrified to have a child <laughs> like I, seriously if well, you read any articles there was an article i read yeah. on npr um you know about this subject and they kind of intertwine the article with an actual story from a, a woman she was a, a nicu nurse or a neonatal intensive care nurse and um she was pregnant she had a relatively normal pregnancy um uh, she delivered when she delivered, she started having excruciating pain in her like epigastric, so like upper abdominal area and chest and her back. Mm. Um, and 20 hours later, she was dead. Oh my God. And she was a healthy woman. And when you read the article, so basically, this is a segue into mm -hmm. complications and mm -hmm. why the uh, maternal mortality rate is so high. She died from um, something called preeclampsia. <clears throat> so oh, wow. she basically had preeclampsia, which led to a stroke, but the uh, like a hemorrhagic stroke, so bleeding in her brain, um, and she died. Uh, so there are some things, you know, everybody talks about the morbidity and mortality rate. Well, what does that really mean? Like, what does that have to do with me? So there's a few things. So there's preeclampsia. There's uh, DVTs. There's PEs, which are blood clots in the lungs. Those things are complications that can happen either 
during the pregnancy, after the pregnancy, which is the postpartum phase that, you know, lead to uh, morbidity and mortality. So preeclampsia is a nice fancy way of saying um, a patient has developed uh, hypertension or high blood pressure during pregnancy with some evidence of having protein in your urine. That's kind of like the first phase of it, and then maybe at that point it could be controlled. Um, so high blood pressure during pregnancy, if you have some readings with the top number being over 140 and the bottom number being over 90, then it's like, hmm, maybe we should pay attention. Maybe we should check your urine, see if there's any protein in your urine. Do we need to start treating your blood pressure? But the thing about preeclampsia, it, it can develop either slowly or relatively quickly. In this woman's case that I was talking about, it developed very quickly. She checked into the hospital. She had blood pressures over 140. Mm. Nobody paid attention. You oh, can wow. argue. You can argue. Maybe she was in pain. Maybe that's why her blood pressure was at, uh, elevated. Sure. After she delivered, blood pressure t- continued to be elevated all the way up to 160, getting all the way up to 170. And she kept complaining of pain. Um, her husband was actually a physician. He was an orthopedic surgeon. Oh, my gosh. Oh, wow. And <clears throat> but he's not trained in, you know, ob So he's like, something's wrong, but I don't know what. Right. And the And this is all from the article. It's you can find it. I'm not saying anything that's (laughs) not real. I read the article yesterday. Um, And so the the uh, laborist, the OB doctor was saying, oh, maybe she has some reflux or GERD that's causing the pain. Start giving her like Mm. antacids. Was she African-American? No, no. But this can happen to anyone. Right, right, right. And like we said in the article, this affects all women like right. even you know you know white women it's it's a problem in america we right. still have terrible mor- morbidity and mortality yeah. rates but this is just a story that's applicable to anyone wow. and this is a woman who is educated and knows about medicine but she still died 20 hours later wow, wow. and her husband was a doctor so it's astounding it mm, really right. is astounding so then they start to notice her blood pressure creeping up so they did labs and there's a syndrome called help syndrome when you get deeper into eclampsia um basically uh you start having hemolysis so your uh, red blood cells start to break down you become anemic and then (laughs) you get elevated liver enzymes because you start having issues with your liver um and then your platelets drop platelets help your blood clot or stick together so you don't bleed wait was this happening during labor this happened after oh this happened like hours after it's it started it pr- it was probably beginning when she checked into the hospital because her blood pressure during her whole pregnancy was in the one teens, so yeah. very normal. Mm-hmm. Um, and then so how they fig- they sent this panel to check her labs were normal at that point, but her symptoms continued to get worse, and her blood pressure at one point got all the way up to one ninety. Mm-hmm. Her husband sitting in front of her, he says, all of a sudden a calm comes over her. She smiles, but her face is drooping. Mm. And then at yes, at wow. that point he's like, Oh my god, my wife is having a stroke. Wow. So if they rush her in to get a cat scan, she has bleeding in her brain. Her platelets are low. If you have bleeding in your brain, your platelets are low, there's nothing to help those blood cells stick yeah. together and clot, so your bleeding is gonna get worse. They get mm. a neurosurgeon in, the hospital has no platelets. They have to call <laughs> the <laughs> the Red Cross hours to get the platelets. Her bleeding gets worse. Ultimately she dies. And her husband was talking, the husband was friends, and the, the wife, they were friends with the physician. Like, it's not like it was something that, like, right. all the, it, these Nobody are knew, things, you're privileged, so, you're not, yeah. So, he, here's the thing. When, they were, when, the, when the physician was being depositioned in court, they asked him about the blood pressure. He goes, well, I mean, it was abnormal, but you don't need to be concerned unless the blood pressure is 180 over 110. Uh, mm. Excuse me? Maybe for a healthy person that's not pregnant, and they're asymptomatic, sure, you know, we tolerate higher blood pressures, but you should know as a, I should not like assign blame, but this is just what I read in the article. Anybody trained in ob mm-hmm. or even emergency in medicine, we're trained to rec- rec- recognize preeclampsia. So if I see a patient who's pregnant or even six to eight weeks po- postpartum and they have abnormal blood pressures above 140 over 90 and they don't have a prior history of hypertension, then that's like, oh, you know, maybe she has preeclampsia. Maybe mm-hmm. I need to consult someone who's ob to address it. But these are things that get overlooked. And the, the woman was complaining. She was saying, I have symptoms. This is not normal. They weren't mm-hmm. listening. So this is where the training on implicit bias and the training yeah. about, you know, what to recognize during pregnancy comes into play. It's really important yeah. because we have physicians sometimes who don't even recognize the symptoms either. 
and continued yeah that mm -hmm. have been already in practice wow. um well we're going to continue to talk about this and and have the, the conversation but we so thank you so much yes. julie i know you have to go this is wonderful um for all of your information and being a representative and getting the information out there and coming on the show and speaking with us about it this has been really fantastic to have it come right from the source yes we really, well, really thank appreciate. you all so much for the opportunity. Of it was course. great to join you. And, uh, yeah, look forward to, um, you know, hopefully coming back again um, and just continuing to, um, you know, support you all. It's great that you're going to be doing a monthly series with Dr. Kelly. And yes, this was, seems like a great opportunity to kick it off. So just really appreciate um, all of the, you know, wisdom, expertise, real power you guys are bringing to the community. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Have a great Have day. Have a great day. We'll talk to you later. Bye. So here's a couple of questions for you, Dr. Kelly. Uh oh. Because this is driving me crazy. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Before we have questions, or do you want to ask her and then we'll do the commercial? <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Yeah. I'm like, ask, uh, okay. <laughs> All right, yeah. We'll do, let me do the commercial because we're at the halftime. So today's show is being brought to you by Zavala Law Firm PC. Attorney Evi Zavala has been achieving exceptional results for his clients facing DUI and other charges for over 15 years. Evi has earned a reputation as the attorney to turn in difficult and even seemingly unwinnable cases his unique talent his unique legal talent and courtroom in intuitions obtain somebody's hungry obtain <laughs> stunning results vigorously <laughs> protecting the me. rights and interests of his clients if you need criminal defense contact zavala law firm at 818-987-7010 818-987-7010 or visit www.zavalalawfirm.com and that information you could find it on our web page on mm -hmm. our home page yep. if you uh, are needing a great criminal attorney yep table for five.com yes. click on the link right there we'll take you right into zavalalawfirm.com and contact evie zavala yeah by the way i did eat breakfast just <laughs> <laughs> so here i mean yes. I've, I've had four i've been pregnant four times two life births um two high-risk pregnancies so now i'm like horrified i mean thankful i'm thankful because yes. i survived these pregnancies um incredible amount of complications so i'm very thankful dr rabin yeah shout out to dr rabin yes are you going back now in your mind thinking how yes, like how proactive he was yeah, as a OBGYN mm -hmm. to my care um now this bill, uh, interestingly enough, and, and the high profile cases that we're uh, hearing mm -hmm. about now, what's happening in care doesn't seem to be a, um, an economic issue. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. So what? No. no. Yeah. E even yeah. in the bill. So the end right. the, when you read the opening of the bill or any research that you read, when you account for, or that basically means like everything even. So if you, you know, take away socioeconomic status, pre-existing conditions, uh, education level, access to care, the mortality and morbidity rate for African-American and minority women is still higher. Yeah. Yeah. So someone like myself, who's a physician, I'm very educated. I know a lot about medicine. I have access to care. Um, I have, you know, everything that you would think is appropriate for like your care during a pregnancy. Even with all of that, I still have a higher rate of having complications and dying. So then mm -hmm. how do we, um, is it the physician <clears throat> the sensibility of the physician and the knowledge obviously that's what the bill is intending to educate mm. but the bill's not out yet so now we're dealing right. with people so i think the answer to this is kind of like the answer about racism <laughs> there's so many different factors mm. that come into play so it's not just one particular thing which is why i think it's so difficult to fix um so i was doing research and reading a lot of articles and you know some of the things that you know we think uh, you know, cause the higher rate in African Americans, um, you know, is the implicit bias. Some articles straight up say racism. Um, some of them talking about, okay, well, you know, you, you, the pregnancies aren't planned and, you know, the rates of obesity and stuff like that. But as I just mm -hmm. said, those things don't really matter because yeah. even when you balance for those things, you still have a higher rate. So, I mean, what the answer really is, I think it's just, um, you know, fr from what I read from UK studies, their reaction to caring for these complications is a lot faster and a lot mm. swifter mm -hmm. so you know you have to just be prepared for the things complications do happen during pregnancy but right. you have to address them quickly um so that's kind of one of the things that needs to be worked out too is you know how we care uh for the patients so when you have your child right 
your if your kid has to go to the NICU or even regular nursery, mm-hmm. they're monitoring those vials 24-7 around the clock. Right. They're making sure nothing happens to these kids. With women, they don't do that. Mm. And you'll read articles, you know, even when you go home, you're discharged from the hospital, they're telling you what to look for with the baby, if the baby has a mm-hmm. fever, if the baby's mm-hmm. doing this, the baby's mm-hmm. doing that. What do they you. tell you about you? Yeah. They don't tell <laughs> well, you I anything. Had, I, I stay had awake. great doctors. <laughs> no, I really did. I mean, I, I but, was But what did they tell you about what to look for for symptoms if something's wrong with you? What to look for? If something's wrong with you. Oh, yeah. Like if I had a fever, mm-hmm. pain, nausea, um, bleeding. bleeding. Mm-hmm. I had to be, I had three months of bed rest. Mm-hmm. I had to hire, you know, mm-hmm. but I had the privilege to do after that. After you were pregnancy, they told you these things. Yeah. Okay. After I went home. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, that's good education on your doctor's part, for, for sure. Yeah. Um, so, you know, one of the fever is obviously a huge thing to, to look for because that, uh, obviously can signify that infection. there's some type of infection right. going on. So, you know, anyone who's given birth, you know that when that head comes out, sometimes it can tear. Um, mm-hmm. We call it your uh, perennial area. is basically the area from the vagina down to the rectum. Right. Um, the head is large and sometimes... That's C-sections, thank you, Jesus. Well, <laughs> C-sections incre- increase your risk for, for complications too. So, yeah, right. you know, you have but to be careful about those too. Me, I personally, I'd rather push a baby out than have a C-section. Really? Just saying. Absolutely. Yes, I would 100%. too. And, and I had two C-sections well, and I would 100%. Yeah. I mean, the C-section is major mm-hmm. surgery. It's so open abdominal surgery. Anytime <laughs> you have, it it anytime you have surgery, that increases your risk for DVT and PE, mm-hmm. which is something that Serena Williams had, mm-hmm. you know. And honestly, those <laughs> some of the diagnosis would make make it so difficult in pregnancy. When you get pregnant, your body changes. Yeah. You mm-hmm. start feeling more short of breath. Mm-hmm. You gain more weight. You start swelling. Mm-hmm. Some of those symptoms are very similar to PE, DVT, mm-hmm. preeclampsia. Right. So it is difficult to recognize. Like you know, I'm not you know. Let's not villainize physicians and say that physicians don't always listen. It, we do, but it's it's difficult. It's right. Tricky. And I, and obviously, it's different for every pregnancy and right. every person. So so let's say um, someone doesn't have all those symptoms. Mm-hmm. Let's say I, there is no, my first pregnancy with my, uh, my son Robert, um, you would never know and I was pregnant from the back unless I turned around and was like, oh, you're having a baby. Mm-hmm. Like I had none of those things. Mm-hmm. But he did come early because I passed out. I mean, there were other complications. But um, I didn't have any of those symptoms. Can you still develop after? Can something happen during a ball C section or delivery Absolutely. without having those underlying? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. That lady that I just described had a normal pregnancy. Oh. She had no complications mm-hmm. her entire pregnancy until after. And so one of the major complications uh, immediately after pregnancy is postpartum hemorrhage. So after you deliver, you mm-hmm. continue to bleed. Okay. So sometimes you'll have uterine acne. So uh, the uterus, when you're delivering, it becomes very, like, it's huge, it's stretched out, it's kind of soft, but immediately after you deliver, it's supposed to kind of contract, contract and mm-hmm. tighten up in order for you to stop mm-hmm. bleeding, because there's a lot of blood. You know, pl- your placenta detaches, all that stuff mm-hmm. has to come out. If that doesn't happen, then you can hemorrhage. Mm-hmm. Most of the times you can recognize it maybe after if you're sewing up a lack or you're like, oh, there's a lot of blood loss, and mm-hmm. then you give uh, medications to try to encourage uh, the uh, contraction of the uterus, mm-hmm. right? So, but sometimes maybe it goes unrecognized Mm -hmm. and all of a sudden the patient's feeling weak and they're like, oh, I'm bleeding. I don't know if it's too much. And you can lose a lot of blood very quickly Mm -hmm. from your uterus, like almost 500 to 600 cc's in a minute. Mm -hmm. Um, So your whole body, if you're an average size adult, you cover about, you carry about five liters of blood. So you can literally bleed out in, you know, a couple of minutes if it's uncontrolled. So that's something that happens immediately. So do you think it's a, it's an idea of more, the physicians need to pay a little bit more attention, yeah. also the also the patients. I mean, I, I guess I'm a big proponent of, of being an advocate for yourself. And that's why I love the idea that doulas have become more- Oh, doulas um, are amazing. Have become more prevalent in our, in our culture, doulas I guess, are, because they can yeah. be there. They, you know, right. they've been with that person through pregnancy. They, you know, kind of know, and not to say that your husband or your family members, or not even you, but sometimes they can be the voice when you can't be strong enough so, to be your voice. Okay, so doulas are a great, support system and that even speaks to a part of the bill with the pregnancy uh, medical home Mm -hmm. Uh, and that bill the pregnancy medical home was kind of they want to set you up I don't know if it was a social worker or a care manager or someone that helps you manage your care because sometimes Mm -hmm. navigating the medical system can be confusing and you Mm -hmm. know how to advocate for yourself so a doula is someone who's supposed to support you during your pregnancy but it's very important for here and here's the other issue with medicine there's too many people running too many chefs 
in the kitchen. Mm-hmm. And what you have to understand is there's a doula, there's midwives, there's nurse practitioners um, who are midwives, and then there's ob opti- you know, obstetricians or laborists, mm-hmm. right? So doulas are not necessarily trained in medicine right. at all. They're there to support you. They right. can help you carry out your birthing plan, but you kind of have to whoop, stay in your lane. Mm. They should never be really mm. interfering with what the physician is saying. <laughs> mm-hmm. You can have a conversation. Mm-hmm. They can help you understand mm-hmm. maybe some things. But so, for instance, like if your birthing plan was, I don't want to have a C-section, right? And then <laughs> you're talking to your ob guy, and they're like, you know, your baby's extremely large. I'm not sure that your pelvic pelvis could right. handle this I think we should recommend a c-section and your doulas in the background like no c-section <laughs> none at all course <laughs> but why yes. is your doula saying no right. does your doula understand why the ob guy right. is saying right. have mm-hmm. a c-section do they understand the medicine behind it is your doula putting you at risk for no reason potentially mm-hmm. but Possibly. You know, to play devil's advocate, there's great doulas and there's bad physicians. There's bad, there's great physicians and, mm, you know, bad, yes. you know what I mean? So it's just that everybody has to, you know, have their appropriate role. Midwives, trained, licensed midwives are great. Mm-hmm. Some of them can even do small procedures and handle somewhat complicated pregnancies. Right. I think the thing that we have to integrate, A, good physicians who educate their patients and teach uh, the women what to look for, Mm -hmm. what's abnormal, Mm -hmm. what's strange, and to open up the the communication. You know, there's a lot of animosity in medicine. There is, Mm -hmm. especially Mm -hmm. with OB-GYN for African-American women or women of color, Mm -hmm. because the origins of OB-GYN is actually really not that pretty. They, it basically arose from uh, physicians, white physicians, Mm -hmm. way back when, experimenting on slaves. Oh, wow. Cruelly with no mm. anesthesia, painful mm. procedures. It's not a nice history at mm. all. So there's a reason why there's distrust, but it's there's so it. much distrust yeah. in medicine that people don't want to pay attention to what physicians say. They want to birth at home and water and all types <laughs> of stuff. And that's cool, I'm not judging, but understand this. Most people have normal deliveries. Yeah. The majority of the time. So yeah, you may be able to get away yeah. at home with doing a delivery yeah. at home and stuff like that, but when the complications arise, I don't know if you want to be at home yeah. mm-hmm. because those, those yeah. minutes are precious. Those minutes that your child doesn't have oxygen, yeah. you could go from having a normal baby to another. And do you think baby. the statistics are um, for hospital? Because that's one thing that I forgot to ask her. Are the statistics for hospital? I think those are like that. Prob- because prob- I, I, probably because, because I was thinking like you know there has been an increase in more people huge increase. you know wanting to do it at home huge and like increase. you said you know I mean I would have loved to have a mm. tub water birth and all oh, that. it just Jesus didn't work out for me. Lord have mercy. <laughs> Listen, um, but I, again <laughs> you have to know you have to you have to be there you have to know your body. I think it's great to to go in there with that idea, but also understanding that you might need to get to a hospital. You need to have a physician. You need to have a history. You need to Absolutely. you need to cover all of your bases. But I was just I'm, I'm wondering if that kind of plays into a factor of it or if this is just strictly no, hospital. So I, that's, think, I think I think with, this is with, probably with hospital. numbers when you talk about research we can only do research and come up with numbers that we have access to so uh, research can either be prospective or retrospective retrospective is when you maybe look at records and you know look at things that have already happened and prospective is when you're doing a study and you're following the results so kind of like the last part of the bill was talking about um, uh, I forgot what national Academy of oh. Medicine, that part yeah. where they're going to try to come up with down. recommendations. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that would right. probably be more of a prospective thing as they're going along with what they're doing. They're coming up with recommendations. Right. <coughs> um, okay. But the numbers, some of the numbers like mortality rates and stuff like that, you'll see that it say the studies from 2000 to 2014. Sometimes those are retrospective. They'll pull uh, All the records, records and mm. identify, you know, bad outcomes and stuff like so that. So I wanted yeah. to ask you about something you mentioned uh, when Ms. Rodriguez was on the line. You s- said something about education, mm-hmm. right? <clears throat> are, are you saying that currently in med school, there you're not being taught the statistics of health issues with Hispanics, African Americans, Asians, and other minorities? I'm not saying you're not being taught that. And granted, let me see, I graduated from med school in... Mm. 2012? 12. 2012. 12. So not too long ago. Mm-hmm. I'm, 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 you know, relatively recent grad. It's just that these classes take up a small portion mm. of your education. Very tiny. Like you if you blink, were you could absent, blink and miss yeah. it. Like oh, if you were sick that because day. Because you, you were sick it. that day, you because missed it. I wow. find that there's so much information wow. on what 
are health issues for Hispanics, health issues for, you know, like high blood pressure, yeah, diabetes. that are like specific that are out there, to that, that are specific culture. to your culture and to your mm -hmm. race. Why right. wouldn't that play as a big bigger. of a part during the care so of someone who's pregnant? Because, okay, let me, let me preface <laughs> it this way. In order to learn what's abnormal, you have to learn what's normal. Most of the time in, in, in med school, you're training, you're learning the normal stuff. You're learning what's normal because you can't figure out what's abnormal if you don't know what's normal. Mm -hmm. So you're learning the bread and butter, the basic stuff. And you actually learn more during residency. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like when you're in, you're in practice. Yes, mm -hmm. you, you learn yeah, more when it. you're <coughs> in practice. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I'm not gonna lie, the med school that I went to, uh, UMDNJ, New Jersey Medical School, shout out, whoop, whoop. it's called <laughs> Rutgers now. They they did focus a lot on cultural competency. I mean, we had we had a lot of uh, African-American um, staff. That's what Dr. Raven was. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's a great school. Anybody who wants to go to your shout out. <laughs> but if you're not in that, if you don't have that experience and you don't have that diversity but I, I'm almost in I'm, For me, it's almost like common sense. Like, I it's know. not. Common yeah. sense is not Obviously, common. Obviously, it's You have not. to understand. <laughs> That's what the we research. have the benefit of growing up on, you on the West, well, no, you're on the East Coast. East, East Coast. Coast. I grew up on the East Coast. You grew up on, Coast. But still, mm -hmm. a large city. So you have yes. the benefit of growing up around diverse people. Mm. This is true. Yes. Middle America down south, way up north, that's not the case. You could grow up as a white person and never see a black person or never yeah, see a, you know, true. an Asian person. Like, so w wow. we take this experience Incredible. for granted. Yeah. Like I, I knew a black person, um, she grew, I forgot what state, somewhere in the middle of the country and moved to New York. And she was like, I never met a Jamaican. And she was <gasps> black. <laughs> like, <laughs> what? <laughs> so we take for granted yeah. the experiences yeah. that we have. Yeah. So this training is necessary. Because yeah, if it's they're so going to medical school there in their little bubble, they're not going to get exposure, so, even the doctors. So my question then is, so you pick and choose what, so you learn the basics, you learn what is important to treat a patient. Uh -huh. So, but in the bigger spectrum, you pick and choose the knowledge of other races to the, in med school? <laughs> What do you mean pick and choose the knowledge? Okay, so in, let's say, middle America, you know, we're not going to discuss um, the health issues and statistics of African American because we really don't no. treat them here. No, 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 no. You, so if you're learning about hypertension, right, or high blood pressure, right. you know, or you, everyone knows that African Americans have a higher risk. You, you know that stuff. You know it. But sometimes it's difficult to apply these things once you're finished your training mm -hmm. if you're not dealing with that patient population right. all the time. Like, there's so many things I learned in medical school. So, then school what's the excuse that for I don't remember? Oh, oh well, I'm wow, gonna, let's I'm, not even say no, that no, out no, now. No, She's no, coming no, back no, next no, month. No, I promise she's very smart. No, I'm not saying this. No, this is, this is, this is it. Because in med school, no, I get what you're and saying. You yeah. learn a broad you know, spectrum of things, but I'm emergency medicine trained, so that's right. my specialty. You can talk to a, car a cardiologist or a neurologist or a psych doctor. They wouldn't know what to do if someone came in shot in the chest, but right. I do. Right. Yeah. No, I, no, I yeah. totally get what you're saying. Yeah. I just find it shocking that this, that with the knowledge that the lay person has, mm -hmm. a lay person, not a physician, just me, mm. <laughs> can go and just Google and understand, okay, so if, my, if, I'm, a, if I'm an obstetrician and I have this patient and she's Hispanic and I'm, you know, and her blood pressure's through the roof, wouldn't I have the sensitivity to know, oh, you know what, Hispanics tend to have high blood pressure or they tend to be diabetic prior to being pregnant. Like that's, for me, that's why I say common, common sense. sense. So yeah. here's, without here's, having to be so inundated with a so bill here, and money. Here's what I'm gonna say. Uh, a wise physician a while ago once told me, if you don't think about the diagnosis, you're never gonna get it. Mm. So if you're not, if your knowledge base is not up to par and you don't think about it, you're never gonna come to the conclusion that this is going on. Mm. So this goes back to training, continuing medical education continuing credits. Training, this yeah. is mm. why being a physician, it's an ongoing learning process because yes. We have to know a lot these days, and it's yeah. impossible yeah. to keep everything in your head. So you have to be continually learning and reading, which is why I like doing this show because it forces me to read stuff. You see all these <laughs> little notes and stuff like that. Like it's not always right. in the forefront <laughs> right. of my no, memory, right, but right. It, it forces you to learn and continue learning. Yeah. You have to understand, not everybody is like us who want to recognize their weaknesses, right. who right. want to recognize that right. I have some implicit biases. People are comfortable going through life like yeah. whatever. Yeah. So, so what do you? What would you recommend someone, African American, Latina, <laughs> a minute who's, or less. Oh, who's <laughs> pregnant oh, we in don't. less than a minute? What would you tell them? They just found out they're pregnant. Uh -huh. What would you say to them? 
going in to see it an OBGYN yeah. for the first time. Yeah. The first of all, you shouldn't be going for the first time. You should have well, it. Right. Well, I'm just saying. <laughs> but number one. Okay, right, 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 right. Yeah. I but GYN question. and okay. OBGYN, aren't they two different things? Because one are. could practice. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so, so some people do both. Some right. people yes. do OB right. and gyne. Some people are just laborists where right. they just deliver right. in the hospital. So, yes, they can be different So, this is things. their first OBGYN visit. Right. Okay. So, what I would OB. do, the first thing you do when you find out you're pregnant is, boom, go buy you some prenatal pills. And then <laughs> schedule an appointment for an OB doctor. Mm -hmm. Have a conversation with the OB doctor. Make sure you're comfortable with the doctor, comfortable asking questions. Yeah. Write your questions <clears throat> down. Mm -hmm. Write down what the doctor Good. is saying because yes. oftentimes you forget. Yes. And then we if do. you have a family history of yes. anything yes. or if you have a personal history Key. of anything, yes. be honest about it. If yes. you smoke or you drink, mm. be honest about it because yes. those things increase your risk for uh, preterm labor. Every, things that you might not think matter, matter. So be very open with your doctor mm. and communicate. Mm. If you feel something everything. that doesn't feel right, communicate that with your doctor. Key. Advocate for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. You are your own best advocate yeah. you know if you feel like something's wrong or you think this is going on say dr so-and-so i feel this way this is what i think this is going is on for me can you tell me why you do or do not think that this is going on yeah. you know just be your own best advocate and pay attention to yourself that that i mean that's that's great that's really Thanks. key pick a physician who knows yeah. what they're doing and don't be afraid to interview more than one physician yeah. Listen, absolutely when you go to have work on your house like, done you usually yeah. get three interviews or you interview different people it's the same thing is your life people mm -hmm. is your, your life and your baby's life don't be afraid to interview doctors yeah. mm -hmm. um and 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 i don't think there's anything wrong with Listen, that you don't i have interviewed to pediatricians while i was pregnant oh yeah yeah sure. i did i did too that's yeah. a whole that's a whole other, that's the next segment <laughs> that that's that's the next show uh, mm -hmm. but for yourself you as a pregnant person this is what you have to do yeah. you have to be able to take matters into your own hands and like she said advocate for yourself yes so, so I like always we've ran out of time yeah. but we want if there's any questions you may have that we did not touch upon I mean people were leaving comments we didn't get to all the comments mm -hmm. but if you have a question about this topic or any topic Put it on our Facebook page, yeah. and Dr. Kelly will be back next month with another hot topic. Very interesting. Yeah. Colorism. Oh, if you we're guys, doing colorism. Oh, we're doing colorism. Yeah. But for the future shows, if you guys have anything that you want to... Oh, I'm not taking it. Okay. Yeah, well, yeah. anyway, yeah. if you have anything that you want to talk yeah, about... any topics. Um, that's yeah. important. You know, maybe we can integrate that, too. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So please, please, please let us know what your thoughts are on bill. this topic. Yeah. And Make Sorry, and the bill will be. It's on. on it's, it's on. on our the bill is on our yeah. Facebook page. Um, and so we thank you for joining us. We hope you've been informed, educated, and entertained As today. Always. Have a great Monday. We'll see you Wednesday okay. with another doctor. Oh, Bye. and if oh. you want to find out more, all you have to do is Google maternal infant mortality rates, and plenty of articles will pop up. Absolutely. If you have awesome. More questions. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank Bye. you, Dr. Kelly. Thank, thank you, guys. Kelly. It's fun. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> You're listening to Table for Five with Felicia and Annette only on L.A. Talk Radio.